Hello and welcome to the J Duke Show on the Horse Network. This show is brought to you by Equivault today and we're very thankful to them for helping us out. And this is the show that brings you all the stars of the sport. And we're very excited for season two. And our guest today joining us very soon is going to be Danny Waldman. She represents Israel and she has quite the story that you're all going to be very fascinated with. So we're very excited about that. And we're very excited to bring you these great guests. And thank you to Horse Network for making this all possible. And thank you to the Equivault.com for making this possible. That's It's so special to have sponsors like them on. The Equivault.com is the biggest resource for training at home that you can find anywhere. It's, it's a vault of library lessons. It gives you your ring, gives you your dimensions, gives you a basic blueprint for how to work your horses and everything is on it. If you're, whether you're training from Grand Prix level to McClay finals, to novice riders, to amateur riders, to young horses, everything you could ever want over 400 lessons on the equivault.com. So check them out. So I'm going to bring on my guest here, Danny Waldman, and we're going to talk about even where she's from because she, she started in America and she rides for Israel and she trains in Europe. So very interesting young lady we have on today. She's twice been a competitor at the World Equestrian Games in 2004 and 2018. She was individual and team gold medalist at the North American Young Riders Championships. And in 2019, she had quite the year. She won the Shanghai Longines Global Champions Tour Grand Prix and the $300,000 five-star Grand Prix of Berlin. So that is quite the season that Ms. <laughs> Mrs. Waldman had. Danny, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks for having me. And where are you joining us from today? I am in Wellington, Florida. Great. And, and so we saw you competing just the other day in the $401,000 class. <laughs> yeah. uh, great, great, great competition. And, uh, and so right now, how are things in Florida? You know, 2020 was a difficult and challenging year for everybody. Uh, 21, 2021 for the equestrian world seems to be getting off to a, a pretty good start. But how is it to be there live and, and competing again at that five-star level? I mean, from a competitor standpoint, it's great that we're able to have these shows. Um, you know, it, everywhere else in the world, there's a few shows going on, I think, in the south of Europe. But in general, there's not much competition. So it's wonderful that we're able to compete here. And South Florida, I think everything is outdoors. So it's feeling relatively safe and we're able to do what we love. So that, that's a, a gift at the moment. Yeah, absolutely. So how how did an American girl end up riding for Israel? So t tell us that story. Yeah, uh, basically, I grew up in New York City. Um, I'm Jewish. I uh, grew up in a very Zionistic family. And from a young age, basically, if you had an opportunity in my family to represent Israel um, and you could choose to do that, that that was always the choice I was going to make. So for me, I went in 2010. I got my Israeli citizenship. Um, I lived there for a short while and yeah, basically uh, I started representing Israel, I think around 2010 uh, in international competition and uh, yeah, and now I've done it ever since and will always do it. That's, that's great. Yeah. And I heard that you always wanted to do that to compete yeah. for them on a, on a senior level. And I, did. I, never, I never competed for the U.S. on a senior level for anything. I always did it for Israel. For me and my family, that was the most important thing. And if we had a chance to do it for Israel, we'd definitely do it. And it sounds like, you, well, I believe from, from knowing some of the riders on your team, it'd be a very interesting team dynamic. Uh, there are a lot of strong personalities, a lot of wonderful characters. So, so just tell us what, what it's like riding, you know, in a nation's cup with, with that group of, of equestrians. I mean, it's great, especially because the Israeli team is made up of people sort of who have come from all over the world. We're not, not a very, there's a few of us that were born in Israel, but the majority actually come from parts of the diaspora. And it's amazing that we can all come together and we have people from Colombia and Venezuela and Mexico and California and New York and just all over the, and then people live in Europe. And it's amazing that we can like sort of all come together from very different backgrounds. And yet we still have like one very common denominator between us all and obviously a common goal of wanting to represent the country of Israel and and do well so it the dynamics are amazing on the team you know it's like you said it's it's a, a group of very sort of eclectic interesting people from all over the place and yet we always come together and we have a great sort of camaraderie between us all 
Yeah, that it's and it's so neat. I, I can't think of anyone else that's done that in another country. I mean, the Ukraine put together an all-star team, but that that was not with the same motivation as what what you people have done. So it's a really really great story and and great for the country of Israel as well. Yeah, Everyone nice. wants to know about your feathers and and how. <laughs> that started. Yeah. And I know you, I'm sure you get asked that question a lot, but uh, I have to ask that, you know, everyone always wants to know like how that started and why you do it. Started basically, I think since I was a little kid, I always had like different hair. I was always changing my hair. I always kind of would get bored with my reflection and I'd say, oh, I want to do something different and fun. And so I'd had pink hair and blue hair and then I'd cut it all off and had short bangs and black hair. And then I was sort of looking to do something different. And I was on my computer laying next to my husband in bed one night and I saw a photo of somebody with a feather in their hair. And I said, oh, I could do a feather. And my husband said, what if you did all feathers? And then I was like, oh my God, that's genius. <laughs> I had the, the creative side of me had in my head like this idea of what, it, what I could do. And it started with like 250 feathers. And now it's like 3000 individual feathers with like 75 extensions. And I make all of them myself. Wow. Yeah, they're all like individually connected and they take forever. It takes like 50 hours to make a set. But wow. initially it sort of just started because it was fun and something different to do. And then I realized that it was such a great way for me to express my individuality that I just sort of ran with it. And then now I kind of change the colors every three to four months. And it just like morphed into this whole other thing and then someone hashtagged it flying feathers and then it sort of became this awesome symbol for individuality in a sport where other, everything is so conservative and everyone kind of looks like little Stepford wives and you know everyone looks exactly the same and it's such a nice way to sort of say hey we're not all the same I am different and I can still go out there and be successful and be myself so that's sort of progression of the feathers and sorry i want to follow up on that but one question first as far as a rider is was it a little difficult to get used to is it a distraction to have the feathers on um how because again it it, it would appear that that i guess you've just become accustomed to it or how does that work i mean basically they're not the most comfortable like i wouldn't say that i <laughs> love having them in. I do love them because I think they're beautiful mm -hmm. and I love that it's fashion and I can, you know, represent different things, but it, they're not the most comfortable. I can shower. I can sleep with them, but <laughs> riding like, yes, I mean, I have to put them in a ponytail and things like that when I ride, but honestly they are, they're very light. I mean, they don't weigh anything, so I don't really feel them. And when they're in a ponytail, you know, they're kind of behind my head. I don't really notice them and so i got used to them and they're they're fine now and and actually we have a great question from a viewer that just came in and i do want to get to this while we're just on this topic because we're always and next week for instance on the show we're talking about the safety vest we're having a round table on that and we're going to have a show on helmets and that so the question from mary page kowalski is how do you fit a helmet and is that a problem and, and is there a safety issue with the feathers or maybe it maybe because the hair is out it's safer or if you can just talk about that because that is a big topic in the equestrian world yeah for sure and i'm the first one to say that safety is the most important thing i mean i wear an airbag vest i never get on a horse without a helmet like for me safety is priority um the on it the truth is that they're put in like regular hair extensions so it's no different than just having hair extensions and the majority of them are kind of lower down so when i do put it in a ponytail my helmet fits exactly the same as if I didn't have them in um, or if I had regular hair extensions. So it hasn't been an issue with fitting them. Um, and my helmet is just as secure, I think, with them as it would be without. So, because they're kind of out the back. It's not like I put the feathers inside the helmet. Right, right. Okay, well, that, and that is good here. And that is, that is a very important thing to, we're trying to make people as safe as possible, of course. And I do know you're an advocate for that. So that is great to hear. Let's talk about what you're mentioning earlier, as far as body acceptance and, and, you know, the shaming part of, of the world in general that we can be a part of, especially as a young woman. So how are you helping to change that culture and how are you helping the next generation to deal with those sort of things? Am I helping them? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I would love to 
say yes, that I am helping them. I don't know if I am, but I mean, for me, it was more about helping myself, you know, it was getting a little bit of self-acceptance as well, because, you know, I always sort of, I didn't necessarily have a problem with my body. I don't think I have the world's perfect body, but I was always sort of, you know, love the skin you're in kind of mentality. And I always, you know, it's, that's where a lot of like my fashion choices with the riding clothes and wearing yoga clothes, it all came from a, an area of like a place of wanting to just wear things that I felt good in and that felt flattering to me. So I think as far as, you know, being a role model for other people and young girls, hopefully, or young boys, whoever, um, you know, it, it's more just about like embracing yourself and sort of trying to accentuate your, the parts that you do love about yourself and not worrying so much about the things that maybe you think of as flaws. And yeah, I mean, for me, it's very much about like embracing the feathers and wearing the yoga clothes, like a lot of the sportswear stuff and just trying to be, you know, feel good about what I'm wearing and going out there and then sort of taking that energy of looking in the mirror in the morning and saying, all right, I look, you know, I look hot, I look great and I feel good about it. And then taking that energy out into my riding and into the sport and then hopefully having that translate into success. So as far as like competitive success. So for me, it's all kind of tied together. And if I can inspire somebody else to feel good about themselves, then that's a huge win for me. It is. And, and it, it is such an important topic. You know, my, my first thought is people that want to be different is they're looking to be rebellious or they're looking for attention or, or things like that. But that's not the case with you. You're, you're doing it because, you know, it's something that makes you happy and you feel good about it. So I mean, again, I, I don't really care what anyone thinks. I mean, trust me, I get plenty of criticism. So if I was trying to care what other people thought, I wouldn't do something that would stem lots of criticism and comments. You know, then I would be, you know, one of the pack and I would just sort of lay low. So I certainly put myself out there, not because I want the intention, because plenty of the attention is not so positive. So for me, it's much more about just feeling good about what I'm doing and looking in the mirror and like sort of loving myself and saying, hey, I like how this looks. This makes me feel cool and good and, you know, and pretty things like that. Think, you know, those that's where it stems for me, not so much about like, all right, I'm going to do this and let's see the shock factor. I mean, I get enough shock factor when I think I'm looking normal. <laughs> so I don't I certainly don't try and do it for that reason. And how, you know, on that, on that, how do you deal with the social media criticism? And that's something which, you know, is a question that's not, you know, specifically for you, of course, that's for everyone in, in the sport. And certainly, I mean, I'll, I'll write, write an article and I'll get plenty of social media criticism. But, you know, so for you, again, as, as a young athlete and, and you are a role model, whether or not you chose to be, you are a role model for so many people out there. How, you know, give some advice to people. How do you deal when you hear criticism? How, what, what's the trick for that? I mean, a lot of it is don't engage. You know, I always say to myself, like, don't engage because it's a lot of people sitting at home on their computer who don't know the whole story. And, you know, they love to just sort of troll the internet and write lots of comments and they get no criticism face to face for them, for their comments. So a lot of it is always like, all right, people are going to have their opinion. You know, just don't engage with them. I mean, once in a while, I feel the need to sort of chime in and be, hey, wait a second, you don't know the whole story. Let me try and explain it. Um, but in general, I mean, how do you deal with it? Try to ignore it. There, there's not so much you can do. You can't stop people from thinking or saying things that they're going to say. I mean, you, you can't you can't stop people from writing things on their computer. What you can do is control your own reaction to it. And for me, I do that by sort of just saying, all right, well, I appreciate that they, you know, make a comment and maybe they make a valid comment and then it makes me go back and think about something. And if they make, you know, just a blatantly mean comment, I say, all right, well, you know, too bad for them. Sorry that they feel so much negativity. And I try and just stick to what makes me feel good. You know, I always go back to that. I always go back to, yeah, but I feel good about it. So why should I let them bring me down? So, you know, there's not a great solution and it's hard. There's a lot of noise out there and you try to just put it to the side and, and move forward with, with what you sort of your own goals and your own motivation. So that, that's great that's advice. Good. And, you know, and thank you for sharing that because it is something that of course, you know, millions of people struggle with, not just in the equestrian world. Yeah. What, what is the, 
basis of your self-confidence? Was that something that you learned at a very young age? Is there, do you read self-confidence books or, or do you do meditation or where, where does this Danny Waldman persona come from? I don't know. It's funny. People always say that. I don't think of myself as like the world's most confident person. I just, I think, I mean, I don't know how to describe it. I would say some of it has to be kind of genetic, some of it upbringing. You know, I was, my parents were great about letting me sort of, if I was an eclectic sort of strange child, they fostered that versus trying to sort of dampen it. Um, so I guess from a young age, they let me sort of have my freak flag fly kind of thing. Um, I don't know, a little bit, maybe it's just naturally inherently who I am. I'm a very competitive person. So that takes a little bit of confidence. And I don't know, I think that that just is inherent. And the rest of it is, you know, I gained a lot of self-confidence in the last five, six years, more than I had in the past. Sure, I always would wear funky clothes and things like that, but I think I'm much more secure in who I am as a person in the last five, six years. And that came from sort of embracing the feathers and the clothing and putting myself out there. And then when you do get positive reaction, it, you know, it helps sort of foster that confidence when you say, all right, you know, you know, some people like this, somebody calls you a role model and then you think, all right, well, maybe I am doing something right. And then it sort of helps that confidence in it. And then the more that I sort of put myself out there, the more that I found I had confidence when I was riding and then I had more success in the sport and it all kind of went together. So I don't know if it's some, some inherent, some from my upbringing and some just, you know, a bit more success helped bring about that confidence. Um, yeah, that's a hard one to sort of answer where that comes from. My stepdaughter asked me one day, you know, somebody asked her, you know, we were talking about wills and estates and, and she, I was like, oh, you know, what do you guys want? Do you want any of my clothing or jewelry? And she was like, I want your self-confidence. And I thought it was an amazing comment because I was asking about material items mm -hmm. and she was saying how she wanted my confidence. And I said, I don't know how to give that. I don't know how to impart that on someone else, but I certainly think it comes from embracing yourself and not worrying what other people think and just sort of saying, all right, you know, this is, this is what makes me feel good. And I'm just going to go out there and kind of own it. Well, and thank you for sharing this. You know, every athlete ha carries that mantle. You know, when you, when you step into that big ring, you know, especially at the nation's cup level at that world championships level, you know, everyone has to realize like you are a role model and everyone in that ring is a role model for the next generation. And so some people really grab that and, and embrace it and, and try to make it better for everybody and others, others do not. Um, here's a comment from one of our viewers. And thank you so much for watching the show and, and contributing from Carla Hegewish. I train mostly kids and teenagers in Rancho Santa Fe. I love how you're embracing uniqueness and individuality and still kick booty. Not all of us fit in the box. So not a question, but a great comment from Carla. And, and it's true. And, and it's, it's important that, you know, especially the younger teenagers and all the pressures in the world and stuff and, and what you're doing. And so um, whether or not it was intentional or planned, um, you are doing it, and, and we really appreciate you coming through and, and opening up about it too, because it's not easy to to talk about that stuff. And and let's move on from there to talk about what you're doing as far as like you've created your own clothing line, and you're not afraid. It's not just your hair. You're not afraid to be a little bit different and unique. So talk about you know wearing the yoga pants when you're riding and the clothing line you've developed. Yeah, I mean, I think it goes back to that whole not fitting in a box. You know, you go out and you look at all of the shops that sell riding clothes and they're all very similar. And sure, they've modernized and there's a lot of more, you know, technical fabrics and things like that getting used. But for me, it was like every time I would go try on a pair of britches, I would be like, yeah, like they're sort of functional, but they, I don't I don't feel good in them. I'm like, they're not flattering. They cut in places and they create lumps and bumps. And it, it like, I just never felt good. I would always want to cover up. And I said, that shouldn't be how it is. And also the fact that we use, like a lot of people wear belts and it's hardware. And I understand like the history of using a belt and it was for fox hunting and when you need it or, or military and you needed a tourniquet if something happened. And that was the purpose <laughs> of wearing the belt. But like, I don't want to wear a buckle and hardware when I'm bending over releasing midair of a jump. Like I want to feel like I'm wearing very streamlined clothes. One, 
that I look in the mirror and I feel good about myself in and two that are like functional and make sense for what we're doing. So when I went to design this clothing line and when I initially even started just wearing yoga clothes or exercise clothing, it was very much about like, I want to put something on that I feel good in. And like, I think women feel really comfortable in leggings. You know, nowadays leggings are super flattering. I mean, it was like this whole trend of athleisure wear, you know, started 10, 15 years ago. And it's really that idea that like, you can be super comfortable, you can hug the, your curves and you can still look great and be able to exercise. So then I kept thinking like, why is this not translating? And of course it is coming into the equestrian world. There are more legging type riches and things like that. Mm -hmm. But when I set out to design my line, the main thing was I didn't want any hardware. And I wanted to put, I wanted like leggings that, especially when you're seated in the saddle, there's a lot, you can see cellulite, you can see a lot of flaws that people don't like. And I thought, all right, how do I create pants that are going to make women feel great about themselves wearing, especially the fact that we have to wear white. So it was like, I wanted to create a competition line where you could feel great about yourself. You could look good. And they were really functional as well as then you didn't have hardware, especially the shirts. They're all pull on. There's no closures. There's no zippers. There's no buckles. Everything is like very, very clean and comfortable. And you don't have to have all this hardware when you're trying to exercise, which for me never made any sense. So that's a little bit like when I went to design the line, what I was thinking. That's very innovative. And uh, that might explain why you chose not to ride for the American team too. Cause I don't know if you could get away with that riding for team USA. Uh, maybe <laughs> today, like 10, like 10, 20 years ago, you would not have been able to get away with any of that stuff. No, I remember uh, some interview I read a while ago about one, you know, famous uh, old equestrian. And he was like, Oh, you have to wear a hairnet and you have to do all this. And I said, yeah, but those things don't work for me. I don't, you know, yeah. Like Carla said, I don't want to fit into a box. Those things are not what work for me. And that's not going to help me ride better. I want to do what's going to make me ride better and that doing things that make me feel good about myself and make me more confident. That's going to make me ride better. Absolutely. And we're getting just such great comments uh, in the in the comment section from, from everybody about what an inspiration you are and, and how much people love you. So that that's really, really great to see. And you're such an interesting character. Um, you have, okay, I... I hear you have a cooking show and all that. I'm a big foodie. I love cooking. Um, you know, and, and so t tell us a little bit about that and, and what would be your, your favorite dish type of thing that if you had to whip something up tonight that, that your, your go-to is? I mean, I think my favorite thing to make actually is paella. I like oh, perfect. I love paella. One, it like, you can put anything in it. It's easy. It's like one pot. Um, I love saffron. So I really love that flavor. Uh, I've spent a lot of time in Spain. So of course I've tasted many different paellas and yeah, I mean, that would be my favorite thing, but honestly, I love to cook anything. Like I love grilling. I love just simple things on the stovetop. I mean, just look in the cabinet. What do you have? Whip something together. So, and if I have to cook for 30 people, I could also do that, you know, in two hours. I really, I love to cook and it's relaxing and it's fun for me. That's, that's great. And, you know, I'm old friends with your, with your husband and uh, really? maybe, maybe one day we'll all get together and have some paella because that's my favorite meal as well. So oh, that's amazing. perfect. <laughs> you have to do it. So let's get back to the horses and, and show jumping. What, what are your thoughts on 2021? Um, you know, the Olympics is in question. It's in doubt. Um, how are you as a championship rider looking at preparing for a competition that may not happen? What, what, what you, what's your thought process and what are your plans there? I mean, we're basically, or at least I'm basically acting as though it is happening. So my preparation, I'm trying to, you know, and if it doesn't happen, then I deal with the disappointment and the frustration of that. But at least then I don't feel underprepared if it, if it does happen. So for me, I'd rather be overprepared. So I'm sort of acting and going ahead as though it is happening. Um, and that means that I'm using the Wellington circuit here in WEF to prepare, jump the bigger classes. Again, I hadn't jumped a five-star Grand Prix until this weekend, which was relatively unsuccessful, <laughs> but I hadn't jumped one in almost a year. Right. So, yeah. so I, you know, I'm just trying to use this season here in Wellington to get back up to the high level, make sure my top horses are fit and ready to go to Tokyo on the off chance that it does happen. Mm -hmm. So I'd rather be super prepared. And again, I mean, it having, 
it been postponed was very frustrating. It was very deflating. It was very difficult, actually. I was sort of like, oh, it won't be a big deal. And honestly, mentally, it was a big deal. Like, it was really hard to wrap my head around the fact that, like, this was something I had prepared for my whole life. I've wanted to go to the Olympics since I can remember. And then it sort of just got like taken away. And I was like, uh, now what? I don't, I don't know what to do. Like, I didn't know what to do with myself. But now that we have some competitions running and there is high level sport, I'm sort of like, all right, I'm going to prepare the best that I can, assuming that it's going to happen. And if it doesn't happen, at least I was ready for it. And then, you know, then we look forward to to Paris if that happens and that kind of thing you know then you just have to move forward they are planning on having European championships this summer as well so maybe that's a back you know sort of a a backup in case Tokyo doesn't happen and again who knows if that'll happen also but you know at this moment prepare as though it's happening and deal with it if it doesn't happen can you <laughs> now friend. As can you compete at the European Championships as a rider for Israel? Is that yeah. yes? Israel is actually part of Group C, which is the Eastern European um, group. So we we actually are part of the European Championships. I've ridden now in three Europeans, or two or three Europeans. Okay, and that yeah, that's a top top competition and an amazing one to uh, yeah. just definitely as difficult as it would be at the Olympics. Um, here's a question from Donna Grant. Will Lizzie Mary ever compete again? Oh, that's a big question. Your guess is as good as mine. I don't know. Um, my answer is probably not, but maybe. I mean, well, cer certainly, you know, she had a great. I hope, I hope more than anything that she will, but it's not looking so good at the moment. So. Yeah. Well, and that, that happens, you know, these, these top, top athletes. And they give so much. And, and of course, somebody, you know, we're, none of us would ever put them out there if there was anything compromised whatsoever. So unless she. Uh, her, you know, her, her health is and her well-being is absolutely top priority. I my own career is definitely second to her. I, I care. Trust me, nobody in this world loves that horse more than I do. I want only the best for that horse. She's literally she made my life. So <laughs> I owe her. <laughs> I owe her everything. And she owes me nothing. So absolutely. I will absolutely put her priority first. And let's talk about your video series that you do with your horses. Um, so again, you know, put, putting yourself out there and showing that love that you have for the horses. So how did that start and why do you do it? I do it because I think our sport is so closed off. Um, I think so many people, there's such a disconnect between sort of the high level athletes and the horses and the sport and everyone else who is horse enthusiasts and people who love the sport, but don't know the high level. And I wanted to sort of give a little bit of insight for people to meet the horses, see what goes into doing this at a high level, see how much care we take for the horses and, you know, everything that we do for them, that it isn't just, you know, using the horses for our own gratification. It, it's so much about them as athletes. And I wanted to show people that. And I think it's nice. You know, I do have a connection with the horses and that connection is so vital to the sport and to the success that I wanted to show it to people because I think it's nice that people, one, can get to meet the horses a little bit more personally and two, you know, that connection is special to talk about. And I think it's nice that uh, I'm not the only one that knows about it. It's nice if I could share that with other people. It is. And and if people want to see that or follow you, where, where can they do that? Yeah, I do all of this stuff through my IGTV on my Instagram. Um, I do a My Gear series so you can see all the different tack and, and gear that I use. And then I do uh, Forming Friendships, which is the series about the connection with each of the individual horses. So all of that you can find on my IGTV on my Instagram. And OK, so I'm going to follow that, that up with a question about uh, equipment and tack. Um, are you a believer in more or less? Are you a less is more type of person rider or are you a believer in doing, you know, having it specifically for, for what that horse requires and you're okay to go with say some stronger bits or things like that? What, what's your thoughts on that? Uh, I don't know if I would say more is more, but I definitely am not a minimalist. Um, I think that you need to cater to each individual animal. And if one horse needs a plain snaffle, then go with the plain snaffle. And if one horse needs a double bridle, go with the double bridle. Again, I think riding at a high level is so much about 
having the horse be comfortable and trust you and you trusting the horse and you being comfortable. So, and I think there's much less clashing as if everyone is sort of comfortable and that nests sometimes with some horses, that means a little bit more bridal or a little bit less and whatever it is, you need to find that sort of comfort balance and then you will have much more sort of peace in, in the, the partnership. And I think that that finding that peace sometimes requires a bit more tack. Um, and it's not necessarily about being mean to the horse. It's much more about actually finding something where you're not fighting with them. And I think that's really important. And people it, sometimes yeah. misunderstand that. It is important to, to do what's right for the horse and to be an individual. And uh, when Ludger Beerbaum on the show said something very similar, it's important to adapt and do what's right for the horse, not necessarily what's right for the rider. Yeah. And, and to adapt your horse. And that's how you, you achieve sustain success and get the most out of every horse because they are athletes and they are they do have their own mindset and, and yeah i mean they're alive you you can't yeah. fight with them you can't you're not going to win that battle you know they're uh, 1200 pounds you got no chance against them so yeah. they got to feel like one they trust you and two that they're comfortable for you to have any chance of success so that that's yeah. important absolutely okay so we're going to wrap it up with my question to you as far as if you could ride one horse from past or present, um, any horse, you get to have one class to ride it in. And what horse is that going to be and why? Hands down, it's going to be Shutterfly. Uh, I love that horse. To this day, that horse is spectacular. Not only did it have tons of success, it was ridden by Meredith, who is a small woman just like me. So I yeah. think it would suit my riding style. And I just was obsessed with that horse as a kid. And I watch videos of it now and I think, God, it would be so successful even in the sport today. So to me, that is top of the list. Yeah, Shutterfly and Meredith Michaels Beerbaum really they they dominated for for a few years there and it was just so fantastic to watch. The first the, woman to be number one in the world. I mean, an yeah. idol of mine. Yeah, no, it was it was amazing. Danny, thank you so much for coming on the show. Uh, best of luck to you in 2021. Best of luck with all that you're doing, and, and thank you for opening up and being such an inspiration to all of us um, in, in the entire world. Like it just it's just great to to see what you're doing. And we really appreciate you coming on to the J Duke show on horse network. Thank well, you thank so much you for having me. I want to mention next week, we're having a very important round table discussion with about safety vests. They are the new hot topic. Um, everything we can do to make people safe is great. And that's going to be a very interesting discussion. We have a developer from Europe, a manufacturer coming on, someone to help design the vests. And we have a couple other experts as well. So please join us for the safety vest roundtable discussion. I want to thank Equivault.com for joining us. Check out the Equivault.com. It is your best online resource for training at home or at the horse shows. You'll find over 400 online lessons there to set you and your horse up for great success. I want to thank Carly Sparks and Horse Network for making this all possible. She does the best job and it's so much fun to be on this show. So I really appreciate that. As always, ride safely and respect the horse. Take care, everyone.